wants to dump me out. Welcome and thank you for joining me. This is Laurie of Laurie's Heirloom Sewing. It is um, a sunny March day in Washington State, uh, what we call the western side. And um, while it is sunny outside, it's very cold. Um, all the cars have frost, all the roofs have frost, the grass is frosty. So I'm kind of glad I'm inside sewing. Um, because we are in the middle of a, a worldwide virus outbreak, um, a lot of people are not able to go to work, and um, I know that's causing a lot of stress. So I just kind of want to do a little chill sewing project, um, hopefully to soothe some nerves. You know, I think if we just use common sense, try to stay, um, you know, away from crowded areas and, and wash your hands. You know, if you wash your hands all through, you know, wa really wash your hands with, with soap and warm water, if the water feels warm to your hands, then it's not lukewarm, it's slightly above lukewarm. It's above body temperature if it feels warm, so it's probably around 100... 510. You don't need to scald your hands half to death. And then just, um, you know, get between your fingers, get under your fingernails if you have a little um, brush that you can use. All around, if you can, take your rings off. Wash your rings with water. Um, and then um, use a clean towel to dry your hands or air. Um, and sing the ABC song. If you don't know the ABC song, sing Happy Birthday. And don't bolt through it. In your head, just sing the Happy Birthday song the normal amount of time. And that's around 20 to 25 seconds, which is the amount of time it needs, your hands need to be under running water to wash away, you know, bacteria and dirt and debris um, and, and really keep you safe. But most importantly, even if you can wash your hands, try not to touch your face. Don't rub your eyes. Don't, you know, use your hand to scratch your nose. Don't run your hand across your mouth. Just keep your hands away from your face. It, it's a habit. I've watched a lot of people over the last few days. I don't think they even realize they're doing it. So um, it's just a good idea to keep your hands away from your face. Just kind of repeat that mantra in your mind. So wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Stay away from huge crowds of people. And by huge, I mean where you don't have at least six feet between you and the person you know, the people around you. Um, that's that's the number one thing right there. Um, and if you can just stay home, try to stay home. Sometimes that's a better idea. You know, clean out a closet or something. Use that time to do something productive. Okay, so the last time we talked, we I was working on this pattern right here. And that very first project right there. And this is how the first one that I created turned out. Um, as you can see, there is a white piece of fabric that goes all the way around my project all the way around and then on top of that to kind of bridge the gap between the print fabric and the white fabric I put some rickrack. I didn't really know how I was going to finish this off. It it really was just sort of a um, let me just get it done. This is the rickrack that I used but I simply used the reverse. I didn't think that that um, tie-dye would look good with the pro the fabric I had. Um, I would have preferred something a little less 
jarring than white, but because this is the first one that I've made, I'm okay with it. It still serves its purpose. And now that I kind of have a better idea of the way, the mechanics of how this goes together, um, I will be doing another one, but I'm going to give it a rest for now. I have this one over by my ironing board. Um, I did not put a backing on it. It's simply this, but I'm going to tell you how I did it. Now, I would have filmed doing this, but my husband works for a very large company, and there was a um, directive that they go home on Thursday uh, and then um, not return Friday and not return over the weekend, although he doesn't typically work on the weekends. Uh, they just wanted things to, to not, just to stay home. Um, and then today there was another, eh, stay home if you can. Unfortunately, um, he does have to go. There's some business he needs to take care of. So um, I, I wasn't able to film because he was in telecommuting meetings and they didn't really want to listen to me talking about this and I don't have a good setup where I'm, you know, by myself. So what I can do is kind of give you a walkthrough of how I accomplished this. If you like this or if you are experiencing a similar situation and need to know how I did this. So I basically utilized my heirloom sewing history and knowledge and I applied the um, the white fabric which was the flower sack material that I have to the circle. Let me get that other little circle wherever it ended up. Oh, where did the little circle go? Hmm, odd. Very strange. I thought I had it out. Hmm. If not, then I'll just show you on the pattern piece. Oh, it's very odd. Hmm. Okay, well... piece and was cut out per a pattern piece provided with the um, the actual pattern and it is meant to go on the reverse of a nine inch uh, embroidery hoop but I'm just going to show you because this is a 12 inch what I did, so I took the this piece right here with the pocket, which I don't have a pocket for this, but we're just going to pretend that there is a pocket stitched on here. And then I literally took a piece of this. It looked basically like this, maybe a little bit longer. And I laid it on top exactly halfway down my circle so from the top of the circle to the middle of the circle you just find the halfway point and you can do that by folding it in half and then take whatever color piece of fabric you want and lay and it doesn't have to be pretty none of these edges have to be finished or pretty or anything. These are all rough cut. Just lay it right there so that you have, I don't know, I'll pin it so you can see through the light because you want to have obvious um, extra, excess fabric that that goes way beyond your circle. So um, okay. 
like th uh, like this. And that for me, that is that's right at one end. Oh, it's a little bit. So if I'm on the one inch mark at the top of my circle, this is one and a half inches beyond the top. And then of course there's way more out here, but you need it to go at least one and a half inches all the way around the outer edge of the top half of your circle. And then exactly the same thing for the bottom half and you want to overlap these two that meet in the center so that there's just a slight overlap on the outer edge on the sides where these two meet up. And then pin that down so that you have at least, you know, one and a half inches extending beyond your circle. And pin it however you want to pin it. And I'll explain that in just a second. And I am going to go ahead and stitch this because I want you to see what I did, how I did it, and why it works in this particular case. Just in case you ever need to do it for any other project that you might be involved in. But see, as you can see, I now have this. Now, if you happen to have a solid piece of fabric, that's fine. You can do it, but you will have to cut an opening somewhere on the front side once you get this all applied on here. I just happened to find it was easier for me to use the two. These were pre-cut. I, I had used them for something else, and I just used them because I knew I was going to need to have access after I stitched this to my circle. Okay, so now I'm going to flip it over. I'm going to set my sewing machine on a zigzag stitch in the needle down position. And however you prefer to do your zigzag stitch, that's perfectly fine but you're going to want something that's going to be fairly close together. So if you're not sure what that setting on your, that default setting for a zigzag on your sewing machine is, do a couple of practice stitches and then I'll show you what mine looks like so that you can see, you know, what it should look like. Now, if you're, um, pins are in the way of your stitching, you're going to need to either move them or put the pins on the other side. I can feel where mine are and I'm going to start in down here where I have the two pieces of fabric um, meeting in the in the side. I'm calling it the side but a circle doesn't really have a side. Okay, move that pin out of the way and I need my machine to be in needle down because if I have to stop, I'm on a circle and I don't want to lose my sewing line and I don't want it to zig off of my zigzag line. So having it in the needle down position really helps. You could also do this by hand if you're really into sewing by hand. Then just do an embroidery satin stitch um, all the way around the edge. Okay, so here we go. And I'm sewing so that I'm half on my print fabric and half on my extra fabric. Now some sewing machines, oddly, um, will, if the faster you go, the closer together the stitches get, or conversely, the faster you go, the further apart your stitches will get, no matter what that default setting is. So that's something else to check if you've not used your um, pre preset zigzag. And don't pull 
or hold your circle because it will get wavy. Um, the whole circle has a lot of stretch, even on a woven fabric. doubling over anything. And we're just going to meet up with our original starting point here. I don't want to sew over that thread. Okay. okay, so then trim out your threads. have on both the front and the back. Okay. You can remove your pins. And if you happen to have a set of embroidery scissors. Um, there are several different types of scissors that would work well for this. I have, I just used my, um, those black handle gingers right there. Uh, I did this originally, but if you've ever wondered what this was for, if you have some, if you've seen some, if you want to get some, I will show you. What a marvelous tool this guy is. So you're going to cut like this. And what this does is it lies flat along your sewing. I'm on the wrong side. I'm looking in the camera and not what I'm doing. Okay. And you're just going to trim as close to your stitching as you can without cutting through your stitching. And this keeps your fabric, your under fabric, safe. So you just go along this edge. I'm hoping that's showing up. As you can see, I'm trimming. Now, if this was a solid piece of fabric, I would have had to cut, you know, cut an opening to get to this side. But um, I didn't need to because it was folded. You can also just use some straight scissors, but you do have to, you know, be careful, and you will have a little bit harder time getting as close to those stitches, you know, as you can with this uh, duckbill type. These are gingers. I honestly don't know anymore what they cost. I used to sell these in my shop. There's no affiliation anymore with that. I don't have a shop and I don't um, I don't sell scissors. I don't have any affiliation with ginger. But um, back in the day, I th you know, I think I was selling these retail as like 27 but I haven't looked at them, so I have no idea that was way, it was about 20 years ago. I had an actual retail shop. Okay, so now we're coming up around the edge where we started. Okay, I would save those. All right, and then if you have any spots like right here I kind of missed, um, I do recommend just taking a pair of scissors and kind of bending it back and, you know, cleaning up some of those edges. All right. And just be very careful that you don't cut through that, you know, that print fabric. All right. So now we have 
this and we could take probably a nine inch hoop and what this does is it gives us that little extra bit of fabric I am so hoop challenged. You have no idea how long it took me to get that thing centered and as good as I could possibly get it. So frustrating. And these hoops, I, I just don't know. I mean, you can see this fabric is very thin. It's like this hoop thing is just not working for me. I've never had an embroidery hoop as difficult to work with as these two are. Um, this one and the nine inch. Um, I think it's a brand that I found on, on Amazon that's like really inexpensive. Um, but I mean, I used to do just oodles of embroidery and I had a lot of really nice embroidery hoops, but these are not my favorite, I gotta say. Now these birds are upside down, so obviously I'm gonna have to, if I want to use this particular piece of fabric, I would have um, a, uh, I'd have to flip it over. But then after you apply your hoop, like I've done here, then you just take your scissors and cut the excess fabric, and then, um, you know, you're good to go. Now, if you want to put a piece of uh, trim, obviously you would need to do that before you, you know, get it set in the hoop. Um, and I just used that um, that rickrack because I had it. I, I bought it as part of a bundle at a garage sale, God, probably a decade ago. And it was just in this box of stuff. It's not like I went to the store and purchased rickrack. Um, but anyway, um, I'm going to save this because I probably will put a pocket on, um, which would be just halfway, and then um, I can finish this, you know, and, and have myself another little wall hanging um, doodad. Okay, so there's that. Let me move this fabric out of the way. And let's look at some of the other um, fabrics. Now, I know the next project that I want to do from that pattern is the what they're calling the caddy. And that's why I purchased this gorgeous um, pink felt fabric. And that is um, project number uh, or letter I. And by the way, um, I probably will do the little uh, pin cushion that hangs from this that we just did, but I'm not sure yet. Um, I'm kind of on the fence about it, so I decided to, because this one is over by my ironing board, the one that I plan to have here by my sewing machine would have that, and um, I'm, I'm just kind of on the fence about whether or not I want one on that side of the room as well. So we'll see, we'll, we'll get to that part eventually. But let's see, so for, for our project I, we need to use pieces, that's the wall organizer. So what I'm doing is I'm reading the pattern. If you've never read a pattern before, I think a um, craft pattern like this is basically your best bet for starting 
uh, sewing. If you've not sewn before, um, you're not having to fit anything to a human body. And um, mistakes are easier to deal with in a craft item as opposed to something that you would need to fit to a person. Um, I would, my next suggestion would be after you've mastered some of the sewing skills and pattern reading um, ability from this type of pattern is to move into something like maybe a pair of pajama bottoms or even a whole set of pajamas, you know, a top and a bottom um, in a cotton uh, non-stretch fabric. My suggestion is to start with the cottons, you know, with a, a, a woven as opposed to a stretch fabric because those fabrics are a little bit more fiddly to deal with. I wouldn't say they're more difficult, but the, the instructions are going to be very different. Okay, so for this particular pet number I, we are going to need piece 25. We have to cut one of the fabric and one of fleece, which I think I'm using the, the wool felt instead of fleece. That's what I'm doing. It's the same thing, so yes, obviously. Okay, and then the caddy top and the pockets, we're going to need pieces 21, 22, 23, and 24. Uh, for all of that, and then the binding is piece number 26, okay, felt, okay, no, so felt, hmm, okay, well, we're just going to move along and see what we're doing, all right, so I know I need piece 25, which I believe is a rather large piece, and I know I need piece 26. Piece 26 is um, for the binding, and we're going to talk about that. And then um, 21, Now the way I put my pattern pieces in the envelope, I can see all of the pattern numbers and that helps when I'm looking for pattern pieces. While, while it may not look like it, it does. Okay, so there's that. There's that. I need 24. Here's piece number 25. Piece number 22. And this is for the, the little heart. And what is this piece? Piece number five was for the scrap bag. Okay. All right. I do need to return some of the other pieces back to the envelope. But I want to press them first. So, all right. So we have our pattern pieces. And we need some fabric. So... I will look, oh, I need to know how much fabric. All right, so on the back of the pattern, number I, the caddy, it's going to tell me um, I need a half a yard of 45 inches or 60 inches, and by that they mean the width. And then I also need to purchase the exact same amount of fleece. So, um, I think that is for the inside, and that I don't want to use that for, so I'll have to use some probably um, interfacing type fleece. I do need to read the instructions and find out what that's for because I'm not seeing it here on the outer, outer part of the caddy. Okay, so... The caddy top and pockets, I'm going to need three eighths of a yard of felt. And then binding, I need three fourths of a yard of fabric. And then for the notions and the trim, I need a half a yard of three eighths inch wide ribbon, a quarter of a yard of one 
eighth inch wide cord and one three quarter inch button and one package of medium rickrack. Okay, so what I need to do next is look at the instructions and figure out what those extra notions and things are for because I may want to modify, which everybody knows I do that all the time. All right, so for the caddy, we are supposed to lap the left pocket, which is piece number 22, over the rickrack trim, placing the upper edge of the pocket along the center of the trim and turning under the ends at the side edges. Okay, so basically what they mean by that is, I'll show you with what I have left here. So we'll pretend like this is what we're doing. So the center of your rickrack is basically, if you could just draw a straight line right down the middle. Um, I, and I know that obviously you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's right along that line. That just runs straight down the center of your rickrack where I have that pin attached. If you can see that. Okay. So the left pocket is going to be lapped over where well, you have to fold under. You might want to trim it so that it meets up you know, one one piece of your um, rickrack, say an up wave, meets an up wave, if you have enough to do that with, like that. I don't know if that's showing up. I'm doing, doing what I can. So there's an up wave right there, and there's an up wave, and if you just match them up, then they don't show on the other side. But if they aren't matched up, then you're going to have an up wave showing over the top of a down wave. Okay. So you'll fold that back, matching it up, and then attach it so that half of the rickrack is showing behind your fabric. Like that. Not on top like that. That's not what they're telling you to do. What they're telling you to do is obscure half of your rickrack behind the fabric like that. Okay. Okay, placing the upper edge of the pocket along the center of the trim and turning under the ends at the side edges and stitch the pocket close to the upper edge. Prepare the center pocket and the right pocket same as for the left pocket. So all of the pockets are going to have that rickrack trim across the top. Should you choose to use rickrack trim? I may not. I may decide to make a piece of fabric binding, you know, out of a piece like this. It, this is the pocket binding that I used for the, um, for this. So you would just cut a piece of fabric and then, you know, fold it and have it go along the top edge. You can trim out your pocket however you want to. The fabric and the pattern calls for rickrack trim. I'm not that fond of rickrack trim, so I probably won't use it again. I only used it on this because I wanted to hide my stitching. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do all the pockets the same according to our instructions and under caddy I it is instruction number two. And then we're going to cut 
Oh, let's see, stitch the side and lower edges of the pockets in place. So piece number 21 is the big piece and it's going to tell us where we're supposed to put these pockets and we'll just put them where we're supposed to, not 21, piece number 20, yeah, piece number 21, sorry. Okay, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. So this is piece number 21, the big, huge, whoops, thing right here. These are the pockets, and it's going to show us on the pattern piece where we're supposed to put these pockets. And then we just stitch them down. And then, for example, number 24 has stitch lines. So we've, we've got little, you know, we can put pins or whatever in there. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to cut the ribbon in half and pin ribbons to the caddy top, turning under the ends at the broken lines as shown, and then stitch across the ends of the ribbon, and then lap the outer edge of the caddy top over the rickrack trim, and place the edge of the top along the center and stitch all the way around, just like we did on the pockets. 